Um, actually, it's been an ongoing argument for about 20 years, or I, I've been following it for about 20 years, which shows uh, how ancient I am. It's quite depressing when you start realising you can measure periods of time in decades during your, your workplace. But it has, it has changed recently, and I think the climate in which we view it uh, has changed largely because of the, the rise of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based veterinary medicine. That's changed the way that we are looking at uh, professional autonomy, the, the ability of a, a practitioner to treat cases, and particularly how they're going to go about doing that. As you can see, the RCVS is currently reviewing its guidance on alternative therapies at the moment. Um, you may have noticed there was a couple of papers in the veterinary record over the last few weeks, kind of big meta-analyses or literature review type papers. They make inter interesting reading. But it's part of a broader debate, which I think is to do with the, that certainly the nature of evidence in science, the nature of evidence in medicine, and how we uh, use that and, uh, in order to, to guide, guide treatment. And we do see uh, things appearing in the general media uh, quite often. Uh, often when it's uh, uh, Prince Charles, who's a strong advocate of homeopathy, uses it extensively in his, his farms in the Duchy of Cornwall, it will make uh, national uh, headlines, particularly if, as he sometimes does, he's uh, speaking at a conference of scientists or medics or vets, and he raises, raises the topic. And I'm sure there's a, an uncomfortable shuffling of feet and uh, uh, avoiding eye contact uh, when that happens because there is no doubt that this is a, a juicy topic, a controversial topic, which makes it quite, quite a nice one for uh, an ethical uh, viewpoint. Just a few definitions, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in there, just, but just to help us a little bit. Autonomy, it's an interesting word, often used more in the kind of political sense as an, an autonomous state or something like that, uh, which is to do with the power or right of self-government. But when we're thinking about it in the veterinary context, what it means is the clinician's freedom to treat. In other words, the clinician's privilege, very uh, high order privilege, to treat the patient in the way they see fit um, within their ethical, overall guiding ethical framework. Uh, the other terms there, alternative medicines, treatment or therapies used instead of conventional, sometimes called allopathic uh, medicine, and the other terms there are pretty self-explanatory. But the point I just want to make is that there's a little bit of leeching between these definitions, particularly in uh, popular media that sometimes they're not used uh, in exactly the same way so we've just got to be a wee bit aware of that when we're reading about these things. If we consider the regulatory body or our CVS and we go into the find a vet search engine and this is the uh, place where I often try and encourage students to look for EMS practices because you can search for EMS practices using this but you can also search for other things and including uh, practice interests uh, um, some of them are listed there. And if you search for complementary medicine, as I did a couple of days ago, uh, you'll see it returns 672 practices currently offer complementary medicine uh, for their clients in, in the UK. And that's about 13% of the total number of veterinary premises currently. Actually, that number of 5,000 odd was 2015. That's a sizable number of practices which are offering uh, offering these services. So it's something we do need to take seriously and something we need to try and approach with a rather cool head because this is, of, of all topics, this is one which can rouse, stir up the passions and stir up the emotions. And that's sometimes not a bad thing, but we've also got to try and just keep cool about it and just uh, think what is actually going on. We do have an issue with it though, and that is um, what are these modalities? And uh, this is, in the green box, is just a small selection of what we might call complementary and alternative therapies. There's many, many of these therapies. I've just plucked these fairly at random there to, to put them in. And if we imagine those therapies and we kind of imagine a horizontal Likert-like scale, uh, we could say that we can have, at one extreme, we could have therapies which are almost mainstream or generally accepted or seen as non-problematic. And then at the other end, 
way out. We've got others that are highly marginal, highly controversial uh, and uh, challenging. So, for example, from that list there, physiotherapy and hydrotherapy would be almost integrated into normal practice. They're pretty mainstream. Many people would not have a problem with those uh, in terms of a complementary uh, therapy. But if we were to take Bach flower remedies, crystal therapy, or the big, the big baddie of them all, homeopathy, it's way at the other end. It's at the far, the far end uh, of these highly controversial, highly contested uh, type of therapy. So it's a little bit difficult for us to think of these as a group, as a whole, because there's just so, so much in there. But one interesting thing when we look at the passage of time, which is always a useful uh, thing to do, and it's been really interesting yesterday how many of the papers invoked history in some form or another, we can see that, that attitudes do change. And I remember when I uh, joined the vet school, there was an argument going on about acupuncture. Uh, how, we, how should we view that uh, as, a, as a potential treatment? And I think acupuncture, uh, to some extent, has mainstreamed over the last uh, decade or so in this country. Of course, it's completely, uh, completely mainstream in other parts of the world, but I'm talking about integrated into our uh, system here. And that's a, a paper in, in practice just a couple of weeks ago. So it's interesting that actually uh, on that scale, that Likert scale that I was talking about, it's a little bit movable with some of these, some of these therapies. They move, they move m more towards the accepted end, which acupuncture has done, or they may be pushed more towards the unacceptable end in the light of uh, more general changes in how we're thinking about disease and treatment. And I think that's happening with, certainly, uh, homeopathy. So it's not absolutely fixed, that type of thing. But we do have a problem if we're thinking of it as practitioners working in the real world where these things are about us. Uh, there's a lot of variants. There's, they're viewed in different ways. There's common confusions often. Uh, one that you see quite a lot is between herbalism and homeopathy. They're very, very different uh, therapies. So how do we uh, reach a judgment? How do we interact with clients who might be interested? How do we interact with colleagues? How do we attain an ethical position? And that could be a personal ethical position, or it could be a more of a normative ethical position for the profession as a whole. How do we, as members of the profession, feel about that? How do we uh, make our views known? Now, um, <clears throat> one way that you can do this sort of kind of thing in ethical arguments is, of course, the good old-fashioned ethical thought experiment, where you take a situation and you kind of... Um, examine it in an in a, a experimental thought situation. You imagine different scenarios. And these can be quite good fun uh, to work out, and you can sometimes get some general principles from them, maybe sometimes an answer, or if not, you'll end up confused, but you'll be much more sophisticated in your confusion by the time you've worked through all these various options. So here's a kind of classic dilemma. Who do we send the tram over? The one good guy or the five bad guys? And, um, well, as soon as you start talking about these things, it sort of depends just how bad are the bad guys and just how good is the good guy. Is he, like, saintly good or is he just generally good? Uh, and, the, and so this is, we, we can kind of run into the, these issues with these types of things. It can be quite good fun uh, thinking about them. But I guess most of you, a bit uh, uh, like me, there's a bit of advocacy in you. You want to do the right thing. You want to make the world a better place uh, for animals. And the trouble with um, theoretical ethics and uh, that type of thing is that it can get a little bit inwardly directed, a little bit kind of navel-gazing. And I really like this, uh, this criticism of animal ethics by Hans Harbour. This is an excellent book and a lot of really nice papers in it. It's not coming from the discipline of ethics. It's more sociology of human-animal relations, really. But I really like what he's saying about animal ethics. He says... Animal ethics attempts to formulate universal principles for the way we treat animals, regardless of species and the historically and culturally different practices of human-animal relationships. Consequently, this discourse of ethics is characterized by a high degree of abstraction and universality 
and by a specific form of objectification. The language is getting a bit technical at the end there. What he's meaning is that the animal is disappearing from the discourse. We no longer, we lose sight of the animal in a lot of these um, rather abstract ethical decisions. And for people who work with animals on a regular basis and where these ethical dilemmas are very real because they're encountering them on a day-to-day -day basis, this can get a little bit frustrating because it just becomes an internal disciplinary dialogue which has not much to do with animals. And I think we do see that in the two main theories of animal ethics. Animal rights on the one hand and utilitarian, utilitarianism on the other hand, the big pillars of animal ethics. If you try and apply either of those uh, theories to co common and everyday ethical dilemmas, you'll find it quite difficult um, to, to, to do it. They're not actually that applicable to the real-life situation and real-life contexts. And I think this is what Harbers has pinpointed so uh, accurately. So when we're thinking about alternative medicine, why don't we try and think about it in a practical ethics in practice uh, situation? I couldn't get another practical practice type word in that title there, but I, I want to, to try and ground it in a situation. So let's just, while we're talking about this ethics, just have this hanging in the back of our head. You're at, you're at a practice meeting, one of the partners announces their wish to start a complementary medicine service. And this has arisen following a client survey. The clients are interested in it. They would like their practice to offer that as an additional service. After training, uh, uh, practitioners will, will offer three complementary therapies, hydrotherapy, acupuncture, and yes, you've get, you guessed it, the big baddie, homeopathy is going to be in there as well. The proposal splits the practice. Some think it's a great idea, others disagree, especially in relation to homeopathy. How will you respond, or how can we try and think through this in an ethical point of view? How are we going to arrive at a position? This is just a gratuitous uh, uh, photograph of my relatively new dog. <laughs> That's at the Royal Dick Bar at Summer Hall, the old vet school. And I've realized that I'm going to have to get distressed floorboards like that in my house because it shows her off uh, very nicely with the, the color there. <laughs> <clears throat> Top left is her insurance policy. And you can actually see it's got your pet insurance documents for Pace. That's her name. I quite like that as an owner, actually. I think that's quite a nice marketing uh, uh, strategy. They've won, me, they've won me over. When I look in my insurance policy, I see that it covers acupuncture and homeopathy if carried out by a vet. And that's pretty standard in UK pet insurance policies. Almost all of the ones you look at will have that, as will, uh, I guess, ones in the US, carried out by a vet. Um, now, this, I'm just really using this to say this, this actually is real life and everyday situations because if the profession agrees that, for example, homeopathy doesn't do, isn't effective, it doesn't do any good, then we do have a pressing ethical issue. You've got an email, Morgan. <laughs> Shall I answer it for you? <laughs> Actually, see, did you see that picture of the nice Ayrshire cow the, in the previous slide? That was for you. I, put that <laughs> I know you love cows. <laughs> um, it's an ethical issue, this, because um, if it doesn't work, it means that insurance premiums are being pushed up higher than they should be because... Uh, they're supporting a treatment that actually isn't effective. So that, that's an ethical issue. People are paying more for their pet, pet, pet insurance than they should because it's being used to support a therapy which is not effective if, if it is judged that is actually the case. So it's not just a gratuitous picture of my dog. It's making a point there. How do we go about doing it then? Well, well, one way to do it is not to look at ethical theories, but to use a different type of ethics, which I think is a useful type of ethics, a narrative ethics, um, which is basically an, a, a kind of ethics which looks at stories. And I'd like to use a history of medicine type story to illustrate this, to see if, we can, if it can help us negotiate our way through this little bit of a maze in terms of uh, treatments. Here's a character um, who we want to introduce, Samuel Hahnemann, uh, the inventor of home homeopathy. 
the devil incarnate. <laughs> and he has a slightly quizzical expression on his face. He's our anti-hero in this uh, story of narrative ethics. Actually, he's our anti-heroic. Uh, what does that mean? It doesn't make good grammatical sense for a start. He's anti-heroic medicine. What's heroic medicine? It's this, is breathing a vein, opening a vein and letting the blood flow out, ble bleeding the patient. Well, why on earth would you do that? Well, you do it for a whole variety of psychological and physical uh, illnesses. You're letting blood out. You're also letting air in to the patient when you do that. That's heroic medicine. Ick, he says. He doesn't like it. <laughs> this is also heroic medicine, the clister enema, rectal administration of medications when the oral route was more difficult. What, you might ask, could be more difficult than trying to give a clister enema to a reluctant uh, patient, especially when you consider what is actually in that enema, which is not nice stuff at all. That's heroic medicine. And it's a historiographical era. It's recognized by historians of medicine there is an era of heroic medicine, which was 1780 to 1850, included bloodletting, intestinal purging, vomiting, profuse sweating, usually followed by a cold, icy bath, and blistering, putting stuff on the skin so that it blisters you. In the practice, it was thought if one overdoses, then they would heal faster. Does that sentence make sense to anyone? <laughs> I didn't write this slide. I took this off the internet. It's like you take a normal sentence and hold it up to a fairground mirror and you get this sentence. In the practice, it was thought if one overdoses, then they would heal faster. I think what that meant is that if you give a dose of something and it doesn't work, then double it. If that doesn't work, quadruple it. Throw, throw everything at the patient. That's heroic medicine. And it's where we get the, the idea of the bold surgeon who goes in and does the dramatic operation that no one else dare do because um, they're too scared or they're too concerned for the patient, possibly. Look at the dates here, 1780 to 1850. Can anyone remember Hanneman's date? And of course you can't, because that's a trite point. But you see that he overlaps the era of her heroic medicine almost exactly. That's when he was living and working. And of course we have heroic veterinary medicine as well. Same principle, dramatic visible effect from a strong medicine justifies a fee. So we have medicine number one here, ether by volume with a corrosive sublimate of mercury added in. That sounds really tasty. Um, croton oil, which is actually horrible stuff uh, that you've got in there as well. Uh, not, not very nice, but so strong that you don't actually need to do uh, surgery for these conditions of the horse where you'd normally remove tissue. You just pour this stuff on and it does it for you. Dr. David Roberts' Laxotonic, it's a great marketing uh, term there. He's got a nice bouffant hairstyle uh, for simple constipation, which makes you wonder what's complicated constipation. <laughs> and it has a, a laxative effect. It also stimulates the appetite and is a nerve stimulant. So it does a variety of things for livestock. And I tell you, if you look at the ingredients of that, uh, you, that uh, tin, you'd realize it quite often produces dead stock as well. So same idea, uh, heroic medicine, bleeding, purging, blistering, inserting setons and drains, doing stuff that is dramatic to see and has a dramatic effect on the patient. And then if the animal dies, well, it's probably going to die anyway. Enter Dr. Hanneman with that slightly quizzical expression. I think his eyebrow has gone up a little bit <laughs> since then. He's our anti-heroics. He doesn't like this. He does not agree with the style of medicine that's being practiced when he's uh, uh, been uh, born and working. He doesn't like it at all. He invents a new nosology. I had to get that word in somewhere. It's not study of diseases of the nose, which it should be, actually, if the world was a rational place. That's what the, that word would mean. But it actually means a theory of disease. He invents a new nosology, homeopathy, like cures, like. 
he goes to the other extreme from heroic medicine. He uses ultra-dilute solutions of plant and mineral extracts that are agitated or succussed, the term used, to potentize them. The principle is kind of like vaccination, except the quantities of the active agent are so small, they're infinitesimal, they're actually immeasurable. But it spreads widely because it works. Patients get better and it cures them. And it was very mainstream in Germany, and actually it's only relatively recently it stopped being so mainstream part of German medicine. So I just wonder then, have we reached the solution to this problem? Homeopathy fulfills the key tenet of principalism, the first rule of medicine, above all, do no harm, the rule of non-maleficence. Whatever else you do, don't make your patient worse. And so it works and it cures people because it doesn't harm them. And most of the patients, a lot, or not, a lot are recovering anyway. We know that. We sometimes think uh, the vomiting, and, uh, vomiting dog, the dog with vomit diarrhea, has got, got better as a result of what we've done to it. In fact, it was getting better anyway, because that's how a lot of these diseases will go. This isn't the placebo effect. The placebo effect is something completely different. It would take another half hour to go into that. This is simply the cardinal rule of medicine, do no harm, whatever else you do. And there's a moral attached to it. Let's be a bit nicer to Dr. Hanneman, because he was the historical anti-heroics hero. He stopped all that stuff and instituted this other type of medicine, which uh, did no harm. So he's a good guy. So is that our conclusion then? Homeopathy was more rational than what preceded it. That's a contentious statement, but it's actually true in historical context. It was more rational than what preceded it. It has some interesting analogies to vaccination, but uses minute quantities. There's the problem. There's the key thing, I think. It removed patients from harm, and itself did no harm, I think, was why that's an, a, a, an important thing. And it's best understood in historical context, just as different cultural practices should be seen in context. We wouldn't go into another country and say, why are you so stupid doing that? Don't you realize? Blah, blah, blah. It's just the same in historical perspective. You'd, we don't want to wear, wear big hobnail boots and go back into history and say, how could they have been so stupid not to realize that such and such? Because we've got a very powerful diagnostic tool that we can use, and we do use a lot. It's called the retrospectoscope, the benefit of hindsight. It's always a useful thing. Um, but we've got to be careful to wield it a little bit carefully. So is that the end, then, of the, the story? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the end because it is still very much out there. These therapies are there, calling eth uh, causing ethical angst for both medical professions. And, of course, we're thinking about it in terms of our hypothetical practice. So there's just a little bit of a coda to go on. And to do that, we need to do a bit of time travelling. So um, Morgan kindly a a agreed for me to buy this portal, uh, which is sold by a small shop in the San Francisco Valley area. <laughs> and if you enter it, you get taken to a different time and place. So I did try it out a couple of times and ended up in different times and places. And let's jump through it, see what happens. So it's a whiteout. What's this? This is the Edinburgh in June when the mist comes in. <laughs> oh, I can't see anything. That's where we've ended up. No, it's not actually. Uh, we are in a, a different place. Does anyone recognize where we've ended up? This is a really difficult question. A dreaming spire. Where are we? No, give a, give a clue. Really hard question. I think I heard it. Bristol, yes. The University of Bristol, which rejected me for veterinary medicine in 19, whatever it was. <laughs> but I wish I had gone there, because I like the University of Bristol a lot, because in 2009, a rare and untoward event happened here in Bristol. A veterinary qualified homeopath collaborated with a dermatology specialist at the vet school. Now that is really, really unusual. 
to get that kind of collaboration uh, because you're consorting with the devil if you do that. They took 20 pruritic dogs. They prescribed individual, well, the homeopath prescribed individual homeopathy. He was allowed free reign to prescribe what he wanted for these dogs. So they all got different remedies because homeopathy is a bit like genetic medicine, individualized re uh, medicine is how it's conceived of. You can't treat ev everyone with the same thing. The results, 15 dogs didn't improve at all. Five dogs had a, a score improving by a, about at least 50%, and one dog was clinically normal after the, the treatment. Of the remaining four dogs, they then did a blinded trial. So they gave, the owners didn't know what they were giving, but they had home, homeopathic remedy and a placebo, and they varied it uh, over a period of time. Three dogs completed this phase. All of them improved with homeopathy, and interestingly, their treatment-blinded owners could tell, which, uh, could tell the, resp the response from which pill was which when it was revealed afterwards. They didn't know when they were giving it to them, but when it was revealed subsequently, it emerged that the owners had said their dogs were better when they were receiving the, the treatment rather than the placebo. It's on the, the University of, of Bristol website. Now, I'm not going to insult your uh, in, uh, in intelligence by saying how you should interpret that or what's, what else is needed. I just want to leave that, leave that uh, there for the moment and come back to our problem back at the clinic. What are we going to do? Are we going to, um, are we going to allow it or not? How do we, how do we get through, how do we get through this um, difficult area? Well, we can try and look at the different areas of conflict. So we've got on the one hand our conventional or allopathic medicine. On the other hand, we've got our alternative and complementary medicines. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because we can split those two up. Because ethically, they may be different. We may decide we're going to treat, view these in a different sort of way. We've got our business practice. The clients want this form of medicine. Uh, they've asked for it. But we've got our personal and professional ethics. We may find it very difficult to concede to their wishes uh, for various reasons. We've got our idea of principalism, which is do no harm. But we've got our contrasting idea of deontology, follow the rules. Now, that could be follow the rules of evidence-based medicine, which are, of course, devised by the Cochrane Commission, or follow the rules of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, what they say about it. And there are also intersecting layers. For example, okay, it doesn't do any harm, but if you were to, as a veterinary surgeon, to treat an animal with a homeopathic remedy or treatment as an alternative medicine, and that animal deteriorated or got worse, you wouldn't, that, that could be construed as a sin of omission, particularly if there was an other type of treatment available which could have possibly helped the animal or which was generally agreed to be useful by the profession at large. So it's not simply doing no harm. Doing no harm isn't enough if it, if it's, it ends up being a sin of omission because of what you are withholding uh, in, in doing that. Um, so that's relevant. The freedom to treat, but how free should that be? That doesn't just apply to this type of alternative medicine as well, so it's kind of a more general thing. So this is beginning to look a bit like an ethical matrix, I guess, which is trying to spread out the issues a bit, seeing how we can work our way through them. So we could say we can, we can produce a premise a bit like this. If a veterinarian practices, practices under an overall robust ethical and regulatory framework, and acquires fully informed consent and uses complementary medicine, then the veterinarian has been ethical. That's kind of the situation at the moment, as far as the RCVS looks like it. It's actually a little bit, I think, a little bit looser than that because it includes complementary medicine in there, uh, alternative medicine in there. Okay, there's a difference between the two. And currently, I think, with my understanding of the, the, the guide, is that it's, alternative medicine is okay if it fulfills that that uh, protocol. The question is, is that right? Should, does that need changed? The other thing is, what about alternative allopathic medicine, alternative stroke normal medicine? 
and everyone says, yeah, there it is, there's the dentistry picture, we're waiting uh, all uh, the lecture for it. He always manages to get small animal dentistry into what, what, some of the things. But here's, here's an alternative. Here's a case I'm treating with, uh, I'm treating, uh, needs, needs these teeth taken out, but I decide I want to add on a titanium top and bottom jaw to the, so instead of just removing the teeth, I'll chop the, 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 the I'll do a rostral mandibulectomy and maxillectomy and attach a titanium implant which will, which will give, I think, quite good function to that dog. That's a kind of alternative medicine as well. And so we can use the same processes, I guess, to view uh, to, or to analyse how, how acceptable or unacceptable is that. In other words, it's not just about uh, strange therapies we might consider strange. We can use the same ethical concepts to uh, approach any, uh, any form of treatment. So what do we do then? What would your response be? Well, I, I can't tell you that. You've got to uh, decide that or discuss that yourself. Here's just a, f a few that might, might be. You may consider that it, it's a contamination of, of practice standards, that, that um, evidence-based medicine uh, is conceived of as a general good, and that even although you wouldn't be doing any harm, you would be eroding the authority of that by including it in your practice and therefore it shouldn't be included and that veterinary medicine is a science-based profession and that would be a perfectly valid ethical position I think. Or you could say well it's harmless, the real treatment is what, I'm, what I believe I'm, I'm doing uh, as a, as, uh, on the, uh, with the regular treatment so I've no objections to it being as a complementary therapy. Or you could say, you could be deontological about it, say, well, the, ethic, the regulator says it's okay, so it's fine, that's all I need to know. You could say it's better done by a vet than anyone else, so even though we don't like it, maybe we should leave it within the profession because who knows what would happen, or whatever. There, there's any one of a number of, of uh, possible uh, positions you could adopt uh, in relation to that. I think the message that, that I would want to, to make is that what we never hear in this discussion, when people are, are getting, uh, writing angry letters to the Veterinary Times, we never hear the historical perspective of it. We never understand how did it come about in the first place? What did it replace? And why did it appear on the scene? And I think actually if we can think about that, it does help a little bit with trying to find out how we should uh, react to it. So I'd just like to thank uh, you and thank Morgan especially for organising this uh, wonderful conference. It's the best organised conference I've been to in a long time. I think she's done an absolutely amazing job, her and the team. So thank you very much.